Hey, what's up, nerds? It's Paul at Radio Free Hammer Hall. And today we're going to do a dive into the Empire of Man for the Old World. This was my first Warhammer army, and I've just kept it forever. Uh, it Most of it survived through Age of Sigmar, kind of in uh, pretty much the same form. And, uh, you know, it, there was a recent... Uh, total rework of that part of the Cities of Sigmar line where uh, these lived in Age of Sigmar. And thankfully, now they are uh, you know, shuffled off to the old world where uh, you know, can use all that stuff more easily again. So um, what I thought I would do here is rather than going through every single stat line and ability on all of the stuff in this army. What I'm going to do is basically hit the highlights and the more important things uh, with each of the units and characters that we have available. Um, so just as kind of like the overview of what's up with this army, there are no army special rules for this. Um, if this is in a certain way, it's a very vanilla army. But the flip side of that is that it has tremendous variety. It hits pretty much every unit type, and there's a decent choice in just about every unit type. So um, I think it's... Uh, very interesting in that way that this is kind of a jack of all trades army you can kind of build into the way you want um almost all of your infantry has uh is a regimental unit or a detachment or both so those are really kind of hearkening back to uh you know their previous editions of Warhammer Fantasy, where that was really just an army ability that the Empire had. It wasn't available to just everybody. But now that it's available to everybody, it's just um, really heavily represented in this particular army. Your wiz wizards are extremely versatile. You get six out of eight of the spell lores to choose from. And, you know, the general vibe here of what this army is is that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts it is all about synergy putting the right characters in the right units putting the right magic items on the right uh characters and the banners on the right units and combining things together in a way that provides more value than any of those particular things on their own. That is what I personally really love about this army. Um, this army really appeals very strongly if you're in the Johnny psychographic profile. Um, there's a lot of videos out there um, explaining these psychographic profiles, but uh if you're not familiar, the Johnny profile is people that really like to express their creativity and figure things out and unlock things. They are like in Magic the Gathering, they'll be the ones that like to brew um, interesting decks that are offbeat and different. Um, yeah, Johnny's often like to just kind of do their own thing. And whether it's um, interesting play on the tabletop where you uh, have unusual or surprising things or tricky abilities um, or you're just tinkering around and really kind of doing making fun combos out of things in your list that's really where this army sits and overall uh the Old World is a very Johnny-oriented game. Um, just looking at the granular nature of, uh, you know, the adding models one by one to units and uh, having various weapon choices for units and all the different magic items and different 
levels of your characters, etc., etc., etc. Um, it this is this game is like Johnny Paradise, and this army is the the island of Super Johnny in the Johnny Paradise. So, um, let's get into our actual units. Uh, up first are characters, and as I said, uh, I'm just going to kind of hit the highlights for everything here, and that's, uh, you know, kind of give summaries. For your commanders, that's your general and your captain. Uh, the general ability that they have is that they pre uh, prevent panic tests for the unit they're, that they're in. For the general, he's your guy that you're going to go to when you want to take an Imperial Griffin. Uh, he's really like the only fighty character that can take uh, an Imperial Griffin. So that is just really when you want a monster that's going to punch your opponent in the face. Um, you know, basically your quote unquote dragon for this particular army. Your captain is your battle standard bearer. I'm not sure anymore how often you're going to take him for anything other than a battle standard bearer, but, um, you know, because out of, you know, your commanders and then your masters of the knightly orders, um, he's like the least fighty. He's the lower level character that can't take as many magic items. So it is, uh, I think, really resting on battle standard bearer as uh, being the important thing that he does. And in this particular army, I think battle standard bearers are actually really um, more necessary than they are in some other armies, just by kind of the nature of what your unit stats look like. Uh, the masters of the knightly orders. These guys are uh, your characters that themselves punch pretty hard. They must be mounted and when they uh, join a unit, the unit gains immune to psychology. So that's pretty strong overall. In addition, as I said, these guys are uh, your fightiest characters in this army. So having a master, either the uh, Grand Master or uh, I forget the name of the other one, and I should have put it on the slide. Um, they're great if you want to throw a character on a griffin, I'm sorry, not a griffin, on a pegasus, and do sort of surgical strikes with them, hit the flanks, hit the backfields to take things out, um, really kind of harass, tie things up. Uh, they're really good at that. There's um, some great options to combine with magic items as well. They're great to throw the um, the dragon slaying axe onto, or sword, whatever it is, uh, to uh, be uh, an inexpensive uh, dragon killer, which I think is really strong. Um, your wizards. They can go after six of the eight spell lores, which is, again... Just very powerful, lots and lots of variety. The only two that they can't take are high magic and wah magic, which are pretty like faction specific anyway. Uh, also important here is that these guys can be mounted on Pegasus. And I think that's uh, something I'm really going to have to address in a later video in more detail. But it seems like to me at the moment, that in this edition, because it's so much harder to snipe out single model characters, like lone characters, outside of units, that having a highly mobile wizard that is, you know, when they are like move nine or ten flying, and they can... Uh, you know, with the nature of how magic works now, they can just kind of fly into range, fly out of range of the enemy's um, unbinds or dispels, um, and really have more flexibility. They can 
you know, build them as your buff and debuff machines. You can build them as damage dealing machines. They just don't have that much of a reason to be in units anymore, particularly in combat oriented units, because once they get into combat, it shuts off most of their spells. So what you really want to do is have them be able to, you know, effectively be skirmishing around. So very powerful there because you just get to be mounted on a Pegasus, which is pretty awesome. And there's some uh, other magic items in here that can make them more durable, which is also uh, definitely a plus. And uh, the other thing that you can do with these, yep, much like your um, your commander or master on a Pegasus, you know, in a pinch, they can fly into combat and hit a flank. Um, if you're less in need of uh, their spell ability, sometimes just hitting somebody in the flank is uh, really valuable, even just for the plus one combat res or the couple of attacks that you get out of this just to maybe get a couple of more dead models. Who knows? So, more characters. Uh, as I said, you have a crazy number of different characters in this army compared to some others. Um, up next, we got Witch Hunters. They have four different abilities to choose from. Um, basically, it, the main one is um, Magic Resistance 2 and uh, the unit gains Hatred of Wizards, which, you know, that is your fairly generic one and then the other three give you hatred against specific armies or um you know uh, uh, or specific keywords like against demons for example so he is a bit more situational but because he does have that ability to just give you magic resistance too I think he still has a place in uh, your selections if you're worried about a lot of uh, enemy magic getting pointed at a unit, then he can offer you some protection. The uh, really important thing, I think, about those four ability options that he has is that you choose that not in your army list construction, you choose that at the start of each game. So you have that flexibility to change it specifically to your current matchup. So you don't have to roll the dice on, you know, am I going to play a lot of Warriors of Chaos? Uh, and then have it, you know, be not valuable to you at all. Um, our priests, we have two different kinds of priests. We have our priests of Sigmar and our priests of Ulrich. They each have three prayers that work sort of similarly to spells, um, except they're a leadership test instead of uh, something else. And the prayers, um, you know, because of this, you can't dispel them. So for the Priests of Sigmar, uh, their first prayer is the unit uh, re-rolling hit and wound of one. So that's definitely going to increase some of your damage output. Um, next one is giving the unit a uh, five up ward in the shooting phase. And then uh, you effectively have like an assailment prayer. Um, and it does a D6 strength to AP2 hits. Um, and the other thing here is that they can take the War Altar of Sigmar, which is, um, I'm not sure if that's as strong of a unit in this particular edition right now, but uh, it's certainly an option that's out there. It used to be quite strong, but it doesn't have that, like, bound spell that it used to. So your Priests of Ulrich, these guys um, can pray to get an additional d3 on the unit's charge that they are in um you can make enemies reroll their sixes to hit in combat and uh you can then also give the unit multiple wounds too unfortunately they are not uh very fighty so having them just kind of zoom around the board and try and take out lone characters and uh, monsters and things like that is not really that viable but 
uh, you know, in certain situations, that is going to be really good. And the I think both of these priests really kind of have their own place. And it's going to depend on uh, what way you want to lean towards what you think is uh, your opponents are going to be running. Uh, but, you know, mo both of these have at least one prayer that is, like, generically good, right? It, Sigmar being uh, the offensive hit and wound rolls of one, and Ulrich having the adding D3 to charge, and then the uh, enemies re-rolling sixes to hit. Um, you know, those are just kind of generically valuable. Then we've got uh, your engineers. Um, all they really do is buff war machines. You can give them uh, a Hawkland long rifle to snipe things, and you can give them pigeon bombs, which are just hilarious. But other than that, like they let you either use his ballistic skill for a war machine, which is four versus the three that most of them have, or lets you re-roll a single artillery die for one of your war machines which I think can be really, really valuable. Either of those I think are good. You also don't have to, by the way it's worded, you don't have to like declare that it is buffing a particular unit like at the start of the phase or like if you're give, using his weapon skill, then you have to do it like right away. But if he's just sitting there, then you can... Uh, use that reroll of the artillery die kind of at any time for the war machines that he's near. So if you have like two war machines that he's sitting in between, then, you know, you can fire the first one and uh, have that safety net of the reroll. Or, and then if you don't end up needing that, then you can then use it on the second war machine to just give it plus one to hit. So I think really um, engineers are strong if you're going to be running, uh, you know, various artillery. All right, let's move on to the core choices. Um, your state troops, these guys are your basic dudes. Um, they're just threes across the board on everything. They are just the most average units. You can make uh, them a veteran unit, which gives them plus one weapon skill and the veteran ability. Um, you can give them drill, which is very good. Uh, I think that's, um, you know, especially since the last FAQ, drilled I think is incredibly strong. And I, I just want that on as many units as I can take it. Because uh, it's just value being able to go and have a marching column and then kind of getting a free redress the ranks to put it into combat order and charge is really good, especially on units that counter charge. But that is another discussion that isn't applicable to this particular unit. Uh, and you have three weapons choices here. You can do hand weapon shield, halberd, or spear. Um, you know, veterans with halberds are you know, weapon skill four, strength four, AP one, which is pretty good for a, uh, a, a you know, a, a very basic three across the board unit profile. Uh, hand weapon shield is a little bit more of like an anvil and just being able to fight in extra ranks with your spears is really powerful. Um, that will get you a lot more attacks. Like, imagine you're going 10 wide, and now you're getting, like, at least 20 attacks uh, when you uh, get into combat. Uh, so, very good there. I like it a lot. Your Militia. These guys, they are impetuous, but they also have Horde and Warband. And they have two hand weapons and throwing spears. So, when... You've got the two hand weapons. They're throwing two attacks each. And with Horde and Warband, you're increasing your combat resolution. Uh, like, substantially. Like, your static combat resolution. 
So these guys are an interesting choice. I think with like the two hand weapons, they can knock out um, a, a couple of enemy models in the front rank to decrease their um, uh, offensive capabilities if the militia can go first. And then, you know, just kind of like bully the unit with static combat res after that. Your archers, these guys are just bananas powerful, more so just for their ability to be really good chaff and redirectors and those sorts of things. They're really great at getting in the way. They're skirmishers and they have scout and vanguard. So they can just move up or they can deploy into the middle of a battlefield somewhere. Both really good. Your knights, these guys are really just very basic knights. They've got weapon skill four and then threes across the board, and they are uh, lance and shield. Typically, they I believe they can also take great weapons instead. But, um, you know, with when you take lance and shield, they're on a three up save, which is very good. And they have counter charge and drilled, as I had mentioned before. So you can use the drilled ability on the counter charge. So you can just kind of hang out in uh, your marching column until you have a need to uh, redress the ranks, get them out to the width that you want and, um, you know, charge or counter charge with them. So really good in general. Moving on to our other troops, uh, inner circle knights, they're basically the same as your Empire Knights, except they have full plate instead of heavy armor, so they can go to a 2 plus save. And they're base strength 4, and they always reroll their 1s to hit. Um, otherwise, everything is basically the same as uh, your regular Knights. Now, if I was just going for a unit of Knights that I wanted to be a hammer, I would go with the Inner, inner Circle Knights. Um, they're just quite a bit better than the others. And so I, I, I don't know. I think I would want to fill out my core with, um, you know, your missile troops, which I totally, uh, passed over, but your missile troops have, um, either crossbows or handguns. And I think they make really great detachments. Um, so you get that little bit of extra combat res from being able to stand and shoot. And, um, you know, then if their uh, regiment is in combat, then they can just uh, pop off shots at other things. They're relatively inexpensive. So you can, uh, you know, take your big block of state troops and uh, have a detachment of some sort of shooting unit, have your archers out there and... You know, I think you can fill out your core pretty easily that way and um, not have to use the Empire Knights just because your inner circle and, as we'll see in a second, the uh, Demigriff Knights are just so much better. Uh, that extra strength, that extra save, re-rolling ones to hit, they're going to have a lot more punch and be a lot more durable. Your great swords. These are just infantry with great weapons. So... They're, I believe their weapon skill four, strength four, so they're going to be actually uh, hitting at strength six with the great weapons. And these guys also have grilled, which is just my favorite ability right now. Flagellants. These guys are interesting. Um, they've got hatred. They've got furious charge, so when they charge, they get extra attacks. They are unbreakable, so you're going to kill these guys to the man. They don't have armor, but they do have a 6-up ward that uh, is improved. I forget what the condition is for improving it, but it's. Uh, it, I think the bigger point is that these guys throw a lot of attacks, re-rolling hits, and they're unbreakable. So they're interesting. They're interesting. I don't know if I'm going to play them or use them, but uh, they are cool. And the kit is great for bits. So I, I definitely have one of those hanging out on Sprue just for the bits. All right, continuing on with our other troops, your Pistoliers and Outriders, uh, they both skirmish. 
Uh, your Outriders can Vanguard, and your Pistoliers are fast cavalry, so they uh, improve their mobility a little bit. Really, you just want to get these guys uh, out into the battlefield, and they're good for uh, some shooting harassment and just getting in your opponent's way, uh, you know, being chaff and things like that. Because again, they're not that expensive. Your Demigriff Knights. These guys are, again, uh, with Lance and Shield, they're on a two-up save. If you take Halberds and said they're on a three-up save, but get that uh, strength and AP bonus. They're Monstrous Cavalry, so their mount is probably hitting harder than the Rider a lot of the time. And they have Counter Charge, which is just great. Um, I don't think Drilled is really necessary for these guys, and I don't believe they have it. Um because you're probably only going to take a unit of like three of these anyway. So trying to do a marching column with that would just be silly. Uh, and then we got the steam tank. Um, steam tanks are incredibly hard to kill. They've got a three up save, 10 wounds, toughness seven. So the frequency with which you're going to be wounding this guy on sixes or even just fives and then having to deal with a three-up save after that. And then it's unbreakable. So it, this guy is like the anvil of anvils. You shove him into something, he's not going to do a lot of damage, but it is going to be uh, in the way. Tie something up forever. All right. And then finally for our units, uh, we've got our artillery. Uh, your great cannon is just a really basic great cannon. It um, it just has really long range, which is great. Um, so I think that's a solid choice for going after monsters and big units. Um, you know, not being able to shoot into combat kind of sucks, but um, I think there's plenty of instances where they're going to be able to shoot at things in the backfield more your mortar is literally just exactly what mortar is in uh the core rule book there's just nothing special about it at all <laughs> uh your rocket battery um i think I, I think this is the worst of the war machines it's just um making three shots that you don't need line of sight but they're not going to be accurate so i don't really rate this at all um and then you've got your hellblaster volley guns they can throw a ridiculous number of shots but they will misfire a lot so you with these guys you roll uh three artillery dice and when you roll three artillery dice the odds of getting at least one misfire are very high um you know if you roll three misfires uh, on the dice it'll just blow up um and then i believe just one misfire is minus one to hit and i forget what the second one is it's like half shots or something like that um so this is good for a high volume of shots. I would not run a, one of these without an engineer. And unlike previous editions of this, you cannot choose to fire less than the th whole three decks. You got to fire all three all the time. So it's always the three artillery dice. Your odds of getting at least one um, of these uh, needing to reroll artillery dice is very high. So, um, yeah, personally, I like it. It's it's a quantity over quality with uh, quantity having a quality on its all its own. Uh, so I think if I was uh, assembling a like a sort of all comers kind of list, I think I would take an engineer, a volley gun, and a great cannon, stick them all together in a place where they're going to have good line of sight on a lot of the battlefield and just fire away. All right, and then finally, our last slide here. I just want to take a quick look through the magic items. I'm just going to hit the ones that I think are especially good or useful. Um, the Armor of Tarnus, because this 
can go on wizards and it gives them better armor and a five up ward, which is really good. Like typically wizards can't wear armor, so this can make your wizard uh, a bit safer. Um, so I think great if you're going to run a wizard on a Pegasus, so they can have some extra protection and uh, be maybe hanging out in the midfield a little bit more where they're not necessarily always protected. Um, White Cloak, five up ward, which goes to three up versus flaming attacks. Your Griffin Banner doubles your rank bonus. Um, that's real good. It's really good. Um, the Wizard Familiar, you add one to your dispel rolls. So you can, you know, build like a defensive wizard. And then your Laurels of Victory, the Bearer's Unsaved Wounds are worth two combat resolution instead of just one. So if you've got, like, that would be great on a really fighty hero or even your, uh, like, if you took like a Grandmaster uh, on a Pegasus and gave him Laurels of Victory and uh, some weapon that's going to help him hit harder, like, man... <laughs> he can throw out a lot of combat res uh just on his own even though he's not uh you know even though he's just a lone character so that is everything on this uh i really like this army a lot and uh i'm going to be you know rebasing all of my stuff uh for this army for sure and uh i think it's going to be fun it, adds nice variety to like my collection and um you know my game options i like just having the flexibility that this army has and really i think the only things that i'm going to need to pick up are some archers and some knights i think i've basically got everything else oh and like a cannon uh because i don't have any generic cannons hanging around anymore um but that's going to be it guys um i hope this has been helpful and enjoyable for people um feel free to drop things down in the comments below uh check out our channel's sponsor uh dice tray depot you've got a link down in the description with uh an offer code to give you 15 percent off your purchases there uh, awesome uh, high quality uh dice trays to uh not have your dice flying all over the table and they can have uh you know custom icons on them and custom designs whether it's for the your favorite army or your uh club or just something cool that represents you and your personality so um definitely check them out i have i think three of their trays now um you know because i have a problem of liking all of my stuff to match my army like my uh dice tray and my dice and uh often the clothing that i'm wearing in some way all right well that's really going to be it now and i will talk to you all later